Hi, everyone, this is the Encyclopedia Channel. The book that this program interprets for you is called Adverse Business, How We Should Deal with Bad Events. This book is an innovative work in the field of psychology. Its first edition came out in 1997, and since then, the concept of adverse quotient has entered people's field of vision. What is adverse quotient? Adverse quotient refers to whether you have the ability to see opportunities in adversity, and even further turn crises into opportunities. In addition to IQ and EQ, which attract people's attention, AQ is also an important indicator to see whether a person has potential. In the book, the author focuses on the role and significance of adverse quotient, and how should we evaluate our own adverse quotient. How to improve adverse quotient? Help us get out of the adversity of life when we are in trouble, and keep climbing the peak. After watching this video, you will have a comprehensive understanding of this set of inverse quotient models. The author, Dr. Paul Stoudemire, is the founder of the adverse quotient theory. He put forward the adverse quotient theory more than 30 years ago. He is not a scholar who spends all day in his study doing theoretical research. Over the years, he has been promoting and practicing adverse business theory in various industries, and many multinational companies and Ivy League universities are his collaborators. In the interaction with thousands of people, he formed a set of adversity quotient model that can exert great power in practice, and successfully helped many individuals and organizations get out of adversity and move towards the next peak. It's not just those who run businesses who need to use adverse business. In the family, AQ theory can enable parents to better support their children in coping with setbacks and difficulties. In the field of education, MIT uses the adverse quotient test to screen participants in its preferred global entrepreneurship program. When some companies recruit employees, they often ask a question, what is the biggest difficulty you have ever overcome? This is also equivalent to a simple version of the adverse quotient test. There is a saying that life is made up of challenges one after another. Think about it, study, work, love, marriage, childcare, retirement, which one is easy? It's all a challenge. From this point of view, the book Adverse Business has very specific practical significance for each of us. After all, in the face of challenges, we all want to win them smoothly, not get stuck in adversity. Next, we will interpret the essence of the book Adverse Business in three parts. In the first part, I will take you to understand what is the use of AQ, in the second part, how do we evaluate our own AQ index, in the third part, how to improve our own AQ and help others to improve it, to achieve greater success in life. First part. What is the use of reverse quotient? Generally, a tenable theory must be supported by a large number of scientific research results. It has to be proven feasible in the discipline, and then applied to a larger level. Here, we can see it from the origin of the inverse quotient theory. The author, Dr. Stotts, told us that AQ has three very important pillars, namely cognitive psychology, new health theory and brain science. On the one hand, he has absorbed a lot of the latest scientific research results from these three pillars. On the other hand, he has been researching, training, and interacting with hundreds of people from all walks of life for so many years. The combination of theory and practice has finally formed a complete adverse quotient theory and model. So what are the three pillars of adverse business useful to us? Let's first take a look at what supports the AQ theory in cognitive psychology. There is a well-known concept in cognitive psychology called learned helplessness, which can help us understand why some people choose to give up or quit halfway when faced with challenges, while others choose to face difficulties. There is a famous experiment about learned helplessness, 30 years ago, at the University of Pennsylvania, the famous psychologist Martin Seligman conducted an experiment of shocking dogs. He divided the dogs involved in the experiment into three groups. The first group of dogs were harnessed and given a mild electric shock, which was stopped by pressing a lever with their noses. The group of dogs quickly learned how to stop the shocks. A second group of dogs was also strapped into the same harness and received the same shocks, but they couldn't stop the shocks during the experiment, so they just endured the pain. The third group was the control group, who were bound but not shocked. On the second day, Seligman put each of the three groups of dogs into a crate and gave them a mild electric shock to see if they could escape. The results of the experiment showed that the dogs in the first group, that is, the dogs that were able to control the electric shock before, escaped quickly, 
the dogs in the third group, that is, the dogs in the control group, who had not received the electric shock before, also quickly escaped. Learn to escape the shock, but the second group of dogs, which had no way of controlling the shock in the previous phase, reacted differently than the first two groups, they just lay down whimpering and crying without trying to escape. Seligman's explanation for this is that the dogs in the second group were unable to stop being shocked in the previous phase, and thus developed a sense of helplessness that destroyed their drive to act during the second round of the real adventure. He thus proposed the famous learned helplessness theory. Learned helplessness is a kind of idea that it is useless to do anything, which is repeatedly internalized in the heart, thereby weakening the subject's sense of control over things. What's even more frightening about learned helplessness is that it affects not only yourself, but others as well. Research by Seligman et al. pointed out that children are easily influenced by their parents and other people when they are very young. For example, a father arranges various things for his daughter and prevents his daughter from dealing with her own problems, and inadvertently imparts a sense of helplessness to the child. For example, Teachers who attribute good or bad grades to stable traits such as IQ or personality can also make students feel very helpless. But if the problem is attributed to temporary factors, such as not working hard enough and not motivated enough, the sense of helplessness in the self will not be so strong. This group of different attributions was divided by Seligman into pessimistic and optimistic attribution styles. He pointed out that when adversity comes, if it is attributed to personal reasons or permanent reasons, this is a pessimistic attribution style. And if the reason given is temporary or external, it is an optimistic attribution style. The subtext of people's coping with adversity can be seen in different attribution styles. Regarding this part, there is another large-scale experiment that can be further illustrated. Seligman et al. conducted a five-year study involving thousands of insurance agents. He found that more optimistic agents sold more policies, that optimistic salespeople sold 88% more than pessimists, and that pessimists were three times more likely to opt out. This reminds me of a popular saying in the past two years, the pessimist is often right, and the optimist is often successful. Why do optimists often succeed? After understanding learned helplessness, we will know that this is because optimistic people are more inclined to attribute difficulties to external reasons so it is easier to establish their own sense of control. Once the sense of mastery is enhanced, it is not affected by learned helplessness. And many tools in adverse quotient theory teach us how to overcome helplessness and re-establish a sense of control. You'll also hear about more specific methods and tools later on. The second pillar of adverse quotient theory is the new theory of health. In recent decades, more and more evidence has shown that there is a strong relationship between the way a person copes with adversity and his physical and mental health. Maidlone, dean of the School of Pediatric Nursing at the Yale School of Medicine, once conducted an experiment. She injected mice with a certain amount of cancer cells, and then divided the mice into three groups, similar to the experiments with dogs mentioned above. She taught the first group to take control, which means to press a lever to turn off the shocks. The second group learned to be helpless, that is, the rats had no way to turn off the shock. And the third group is the control group. Madelung found that the second group of mice, the learned helplessness group, had more than 2.5 times the rate of cancer in the first control group, and about twice the rate in the third control group. This experiment shows that cancer cell carriers who have learned helplessness or lack of control are more likely to cause the spread of cancer cells and even cause cancer. Not only the above experiment, but also the psychosomatic medicine that has been slowly developed over the years is dedicated to the study of the relationship between human mentality and physical health. As one of the frontier directions in the medical field, the research on psychosomatic medicine is booming. At present, a large number of studies have shown that there is a mutual influence circuit between people's mentality and physical health. A bad attitude can damage your health, but a good attitude can improve your health. Therefore, managing our mentality and emotions well is not only related to our possible achievements, but also directly related to our physical health. The third pillar of AQ theory is brain science. Many of you have heard the theory that it takes 21 days to form a habit. But the author of this book, Stoudemire, disagrees. Stoltz consulted with Dr. Mark Neuville, chief of neurophysiology at the UCLA Medical Center. Stoltz asked him how long does it take to form a habit? Nouvel asked him, 
How long did it take you to learn not to touch the hot stove? The answer is that it can be learned in less than 100 milliseconds. From this, Stoltz puts forward a point of view that the adverse quotient can also be changed in an instant. When we hit a hot stove, the brain sends out a loud alarm. And when we encounter adversity, adversity is also a loud alarm, and the brain will subconsciously respond to adversity. This subconscious response can also be changed in an instant. When the stimulus is strong enough, even 100 milliseconds can form a habit. This tells us that the reactions we have developed in the past to face adversity can be completely changed. When we learn new ways to deal with adversity, we may need to practice repeatedly at the beginning. During this process, the brain will open up more dense and efficient neuronal pathways. When this pathway becomes more and more stable, the new habit will gradually form. That way, when the alarm of adversity wakes the brain, new coping styles emerge automatically. In this part, we introduce the three pillars of AQ theory, one is cognitive psychology, the other is new theory of health, and the other is brain science. The learned helplessness proposed by cognitive psychology is the key problem to be solved by adversity quotient. The mind-body medicine in the new theory of health allows us to see clearly the feedback loop between the body and the mind. The research on neuronal pathways in brain science is the basis for the implementation and practice of the inverse quotient model. Now let's move on to the second part, how do we evaluate our ADQ? The author of this book, Dr. Stoltz, has established a four-dimensional adverse quotient evaluation model, referred to as CORE, through more than 30 years of research and practice. These four dimensions are control, responsibility, influence, and sustainability. Keep these four dimensions in mind, and we will talk about them one by one. The first dimension of the adverse business evaluation is control, and its key word is feeling. You can ask yourself this question, how much control do you feel you have over adverse events? Obviously, this is a subjective feeling. However, it is this subjective feeling that directly affects our autonomy. It sounds a bit mysterious, but the more you feel you are in control, the more in control you are. It's also important to note that when we take action, the action itself increases our power over things. So action and mastery are interactive and mutually reinforcing. For example, in the psychotherapy of depression, the counselor often pushes the client to make some easy and small changes at the action level, such as getting up on time the next day. The moment the patient takes action, his sense of control is enhanced. For example, many people have thought about running for half an hour every day, but the fact is that very few people can persist for a long time. Studies have shown that if you first ask yourself to spend two minutes a day changing into your running shoes, this simple action can increase your sense of control and help you keep running better. The second dimension is accountability. Responsibility refers to a person's ability to take responsibility for the results of things. The higher our score on responsibility, the more responsibility we are willing to take for the outcome. When we are more willing to take responsibility, we are better able to cope with adversity. Regarding the part of responsibility, the famous management scientist Jim Collins once wrote an interesting metaphor in the book From Good to Great. He said that good managers have a special ability to look out the window when things are going well, and look in the mirror when things are not going well. That is to say, when things are successful, they will attribute the success to external factors, such as good luck. When things get difficult, they look in the mirror and look for reasons in themselves. This is actually a manifestation of responsibility. The third dimension is influence. In the face of adversity, you can ask yourself, will this adversity affect other aspects of my life? For people with low adversity quotient, once an unsatisfactory event occurs, the negative impact may spread to other aspects of life. For example, a bad meeting ruins the day. Or, a trader argues with his wife before leaving the house in the morning and loses a lot of money on the day's trades. So when adversity strikes, it is extremely important to limit its reach. It's like a fire broke out in one place. After the firefighters arrive on the scene, the first thing to do is to prevent the fire from spreading to other areas. This requires us to learn to build our own emotional firewall. In terms of mentality, don't blindly magnify bad things. The fourth dimension is sustainability. In this dimension, you have to ask yourself two questions. How long will adversity last? How long will the causes of adversity last? 
For example, there is a teenage child who has poor grades in mathematics. When it comes to this matter, he always shrugs his shoulders and says helplessly, I can't help it. I'm just lazy. My father said that my laziness is inherited from him, of. This means that he believes that the problem is permanent, and it is only a difficulty in one field. It is just a difficulty in learning mathematics. In his eyes, it is a disaster in life. However, if the child thinks that his poor math performance is only due to the wrong learning method. Once a good study method is mastered, math performance can improve. Viewed this way, adversity is no longer a long-term ongoing condition, but a temporary challenge. You can imagine that children with the second mentality will definitely have a much more positive attitude towards mathematics learning, and it is easier to improve their mathematics performance. Through the four dimensions of control, responsibility, influence and sustainability, we can understand our own ADQ, and we can also evaluate the ADQ of other people or team members. Remember, no matter what level of AQ it is, it can be improved. Adverse quotient does not represent your destiny, it just reflects the way we deal with adversity, and it is just a subconscious behavior pattern formed over the years. The third part. How can we improve our ADQ and that of others? No matter how good the theory is, it has to be implemented to benefit others in actual work and life. After years of research, Dr. Stotz developed a toolbox for improving ADQ, referred to as the LEAD Toolbox. Applying the LEAD Toolbox is divided into four steps, which are carried out sequentially. The first step is to listen to our responses to adversity, the second is to explore our responsibility for outcomes, the third is to analyze the evidence, and the fourth is to do something about it. These four steps are connected to form a complete process of coping with adversity. When telling this part, I will intersperse a true story of Ray Dalio, who is the author of the book Principles and the founder of Bridgewater Fund. We all know that the investment field is extremely uncertain, and too many people are devastated because of difficulties. But Ray Dalio was able to make a comeback after bankruptcy. So how did he face adversity? Let's take a step-by-step -step look at the lead toolbox. The first step in the lead toolbox is listening to our responses to adversity. At the end of 1982, Dalio, in his 30s, was bearish on the U.S. economy, believing that the probability of the economy collapsing was 75%, so he bought gold and treasury bond futures. But it turned out that he was very wrong. For the next 18 years, the American economy experienced one of the most prosperous periods in history, and the stock market also rose sharply. He lost a lot of money because of it. Dalio himself recalled, my experience during this period was like being hit on the head with a bat. Making such a big mistake, especially in full view, is extremely humiliating. Dalio's first reaction to adversity is to be beaten up, and the second is to feel ashamed. In fact, many people's first reaction to sudden adversity is similar to this. And if we use the lead toolbox in this book, Dr. Stoltz believes that we can actually do better with the help of some tools. The author proposes that we can play a little game with ourselves. Once we find that adversity is coming, our brains immediately sound the alarm. For example, we can use a very playful voice to express the coming of adversity. Such as shouting bingo loudly, or making funny noises. This has two advantages. The first benefit is that playful voices and laugh-out-loud warnings can, in themselves, change our state of mind and make us more responsive to adversity. The second benefit is that when the brain rings the alarm bell, it helps us interrupt the automatic response of the subconscious mind. At this time, there is an opportunity for us to judge whether the automatic reaction in the subconscious is a high adverse quotient reaction or a low adverse quotient reaction. Then adjust the response mode. After receiving the warning of entering adversity, we then enter the second step, exploring our responsibility for the consequences of adversity. In this step, Dalio handled the adversity well at the time. Because he lost so much money, he couldn't afford to pay Bridgewater's employees at that time, so the employees left one by one, until his closest partners also left, and finally he was left alone. To make ends meet, he had to borrow $4,000 from his father and then sell the second car. During all this process, Dalio did not complain, he took it all down and took responsibility for the consequences. The second step of the lead toolbox argues that we should not blame ourselves too much when faced with this situation. 
because neither excessive self-blame nor shirk responsibility can increase our sense of control. The most important thing is that we have to be responsible for the confirmed part, limit the impact, and then proceed to the third step of the lead toolbox on this basis. One of the wonderful things is that the moment we decide to take responsibility for the outcome, our sense of mastery over events increases and prompts us to take action. The third step in the lead toolbox is to analyze the evidence around us. This is a process of questioning, and the author has refined three questions for us that we can ask ourselves. The first question is, is there any evidence that the current situation is beyond my control? After being hit by huge losses and the disbandment of the company team, Dalio did not recover from a setback. He is trying to find factors in his life that he can still control. For example, reflection on mistakes is completely within his control. For example, developing new customers is also within his control. Even, even in adversity worse than bankruptcy, people can build their own mastery in it. Victor, the author of Living the Meaning of Life, lived in a Nazi concentration camp for several years and finally escaped fortunately. He later wrote that the concentration camps were indeed a very hopeless place. However, even in such a harsh environment, people can still discover their own mastery. He observed that those who lost hope and control over themselves in the concentration camps, most of them did not survive. And those who firmly believe that they will survive in the end and discover their own control, the proportion of people who survive in the end is much higher than the former. The second question is, what evidence is there that the adversity must have affected other areas of my life? Perhaps, when people are caught off guard by adversity, they will immediately think that this adversity is a great disaster, which will screw everything up for you. However, when you really apply the tools provided in this book for rational analysis, you will find that we tend to overestimate the impact of adversity on other aspects of life. The third question is what evidence is there that adversity necessarily persists for too long? Going back to the Dalio story, at his worst, he was nearly broke and couldn't even raise enough money to buy a plane ticket to visit a potential client in Texas, which he never made. But even under such circumstances, he doesn't think the adversity will last long. He began gradually cultivating new clients and building a new team. Then Bridgewater slowly got out of the valley and gradually grew stronger. After completing the third step of analyzing the evidence, we have come to the fourth step of the lead toolbox, which is to do something. As we mentioned earlier, action itself increases our sense of control. Therefore, action can also be said to be the most important step out of adversity. Let's look at the actions Dalio took in that adversity. He conducted a detailed review of his mistakes and summed up valuable experience. He retrains new clients and builds new teams. He made more full use of computers to help him make investment decisions. It is these step-by-step -step actions that helped him get out of the trough of life and create greater achievements. The author of this book, Dr. Stotts, has discovered in years of practice that through the toolbox of lead, we can not only improve our own ADQ, but also help others improve ADQ. What needs special attention here is that in the process of helping others get out of adversity, there is a very important key point, which is to clarify our position, we are not people who provide advice, not preachers. We are questioners and guides. The authors suggest that the traditional approach of giving advice to others, or pushing others directly, may have short-term effects. But over time, things will likely return to the way they were. If you want to truly help others make lasting changes, you must stimulate their inner motivation. Each of us actually has internal resources to get out of adversity. What we have to do is to guide others to discover and develop their own internal resources according to the method of the lead toolbox. When you apply the lead toolbox to help others, the author has a key reminder, that is, the list of actions in the last step needs to be listed by themselves, not provided by us to the other party. Only such a list of actions can be finally implemented. Now, let's review the three parts we focused on. The first part, what is the use of adverse quotient for us? Adverse quotient has absorbed a lot of essence from three modern disciplines, namely cognitive psychology, new theory of health and brain science, and the knowledge of these three disciplines is very useful to us. In the second part, how to evaluate your own inverse quotient value, the author proposed a model called the CORD model, which has four dimensions, namely control, responsibility, influence and sustainability. The third part, 
How to Improve the Adverse Quotient of Oneself and Others. The author provides an effective toolbox called Lead Toolbox. There are four steps in total, and the four steps are carried out in sequence. The first step is to listen to the response to adversity, the second step is to explore the responsibility for the consequences of adversity, the third step is to analyze the evidence around us, and the fourth step is to do something. When we act according to this toolbox, we can help ourselves or others to better get out of the adversity of life and move towards the next peak. Here, we would like to quote a sentence that Dalio often said in the book Principles Pain is a good opportunity for evolution. May you use the tools provided in this book to continuously improve your AQ index and turn pain into a good opportunity for life evolution. This is the end of this episode of the show. What do you think about it differently? Welcome to leave a message to discuss with everyone. Hey, if you like our channel, please subscribe us. Haha, <laughs> remember to like it.